Before I begin, I just want to thank these two people, Dr. Pickup and Mr. Clement, in helping me get here and research this topic so that I can deliver this talk in front of you today. With that, let's begin. So how many of you guys here have watched some sort of election coverage? All right, a good bit. So something you may have noticed from this sort of coverage is that they're often bringing up statistics like, oh, 59% of Americans support this one thing, or 43% said they wanted a certain candidate. These sort of statistics are all over the news, especially if you watch the coverage of the 2022 midterms or the 2020 elections. Now, these are used to make claims about, well, most things politics, and if you're someone like me, you're probably wondering, how do we know these statistics? How can they say these things? And the answer to that is public opinion polling. Now, these used to be those average guy on the street interviews, like you may have seen, on Jimmy Kimmel Live. But we've come quite far, and they've really become something quite accurate. I've actually used some of my own knowledge of polling to help predict some elections in 2018 and 2020. But it's not always perfect. I mean, both the polls have some, have had some misses. See, 2016. And that's definitely led to a degree of suspicion towards polling. I mean, we use polling as a basis for policy decisions, right? How can we tolerate something like that being wrong? And I'm here to tell you, that's completely warranted. But I don't think it warrants this sort of coverage. I mean, the polling industry is a wreck and should be blown up. <laughs> Let's keep the statisticians around just a little longer. So, if you do look at the data, I will tell you that polls have gotten more accurate over the years, despite the misses that we've had. But things are changing. It's not great right now. But I guess the next question that comes out of that is, how do we fix it? I mean, just think about it. How many of you guys here have a landline in your house and actually use it? Pretty small proportion, wouldn't you say? Now, if I asked this question 30 years ago, everyone in this room would have raised their heads. But, you know, things have changed. And that's a problem for public opinion polling. Because most public opinion polling was done on these telephones. Call a random number, you get a random person. And, you know, that's representative of the population when you do it enough times. That's good for something like public opinion polling. But, you know, call people now, you're not getting that sort of thing. You're only getting a certain subset of the population. So the next obvious step would be, you know, mobile phones. We all have them. Give people calls on their mobile phones, you know, quite handy dandy. But think about that too. If you got a call from an unknown number, would you pick that up and be willing to answer just a few questions to help us out? That's fair, you know, there's 3.4 billion monthly robocalls. You don't want them picking those up, they're wasting your time. So, and that's exactly how polling shows up, but, you know, polling's beneficial. So you can't use mobile phones. And that's really the challenge that we're facing with today. Now, to understand the ways to fix it, I think we need to understand a little bit about how polling works. So, Something, you know, when you're starting a poll, you need to have a question in mind. Like, oh, how do people feel about this new gun law? And once you have that question, you start designing your survey, you make your questions, but you gotta watch out to how you word it, watch out for how you word your questions, because that can end up mattering a lot. For example, one of my advisors told me that, you know, back when Obamacare was a hot topic issue, um, Pollsters were trying to survey how people felt about the law, and they used the words Affordable Care Act and Obamacare interchangeably. Until they realized that using the word Obamacare actually decreased support for the law, even though these were the same law. And it, it, only after they messed up did they realize it. And I think that really shows the problem that we have with wording issues. Now, I'm no expert in wording, and that's not what I'm here to talk about today. But there are plenty of people working very hard on it, including my advisor, Mr. Clement. But the next step along the process, you know, once you've got your survey design down, you coded it, whatever, you send it out to a few people, you select them, 
and they all do a survey, you get back, the, you get the results back. But there's no such thing as a perfect sample. So you've got to wait your results because you've got to adjust it to how the population actually looks like and how your sample looks like. You know, your, the demographics and so on. Now, you don't want to do this too much because you might overvalue some responses uh, and you don't want to do this inaccurately. So what pollsters typically do is use what's called a gold standard survey. So these are things that are quite accurate, hyper-precise, like the census or the American Community Survey. And they wait along the demographic lines. And then, you know, once you have that waiting down, you do a little bit of your analysis, you write it up, send it out, publish it, and the media talks about it. Now, so that's the current situation. And we do have a few problems. So let's go back to that whole issue about selecting people. That process is called sampling. And, you know, we just talked about how telephones aren't working, we talked about how mobile phones aren't working. So I encourage you all to think about where else we've gone in the past few decades. And if what's popping into your mind is the internet, you're bang on. That would be the logical solution to our little predicament here. And it turns out that it is. So that's a very complicated graph, but let me explain it. So, for example, in an, this is an analysis of the 2020 likely voter polls uh, done by, I believe, uh, Peter Renz, a uh, statistician, if you know who that is. But essentially, there now, his analysis found that probability, these are the typically phone-based polls that you have, had an average error of about 6% from the actual outcome in 2020, compared to the typically online, non-probability polling, that had an error of about 3.6%. And there's countless examples like these, this is just one of them, that show that online polling, particular non-probability polling, is performing better. And that makes sense because, well, you are reaching a truly random set of people on the internet. Nearly everyone uses it. But that's not the only way that we can improve polling. Remember I talked about waiting, where you try to adjust your samples, demographics, to the population's demographics? Well, that's great and all, right? I mean, you adjust for race and ethnicity and education and all those things. But what really matters in predicting an election is who's actually going to vote. And that's notoriously difficult to predict. I mean, you know, even if you ask people, you know, are you likely to vote? They still might not vote. Especially if you're asking them two months in advance. Because guess what? Those decisions aren't made up then. But what we have found is that waiting in the past couple of weeks, previous couple of weeks before an election, is miraculous for actually helping find the, is, act, is miraculous in helping determine the accuracy of those polls in the end. Because this makes sense, right? You have your late deciders, your swing voters, making up their minds in the last few, last few weeks before the election, and really deciding whether they're going to vote or not. And if you can capture this swing in public sentiment that occurs, your poll is probably going to be quite accurate. And I focus on, you know, how polling can improve these two things, online polling, waiting for likely voters at the end. But it's not always about the poll. You know, like I said, the polls were historically accurate in 2022. But yet, most Americans don't even believe that they're accurate. So it's not always about the polling, and you may be wondering, well, what else? And I encourage you to think about where you consume your polling, on average. It would be the media, right? So how many of you guys here have read some sort of headline that talked about this big polling change that just occurred? I see some hands, not too many. Um, well, if you haven't, now you have. This is a very classic headline for news media because it, you know, gets your clicks. Because, oh my god, something's changing. It's huge. Well, it's usually not the case. So, the study that I'm quoting here is Larson and Fuzekas, uh, the two Danish statisticians. They analyzed the media environment in Denmark, which is quite non-polarized compared to our quite polarized media environment, comparatively. Uh, and they found that of the, of the headlines that talked about some sort of polling change, 82% of these polls weren't even statistically significant, didn't warrant discussion, and were overall not important 
They also found that the two polls that the media focused most on were the two outliers. Now that's not good, right? I mean, we're using these sort of polls to create all sorts of narratives all over the media. And people watch this news coverage, believe it to be true, and then get immensely disappointed when the actual outcome differs from what they thought would actually happen. We've all seen that happen over the past few elections. And there's no way to sugarcoat this. This just needs to stop. I mean, why are we lying to people? Now, I mean, these are all quite idealistic things. You know, these are gradual processes that will happen over a few years. But there are a few ways that you, as a citizen, can actually be ahead of the curve and understand these polls accurately to make good conclusions off of them. And the first thing that I'm going to encourage you guys to do whenever you see a poll that may somehow influence your opinion, look at what the poll actually did. Who did it ask? What did it ask? If it's, you know, a randomly sampled poll from an online panel, it's quite likely to be accurate. If it's a poorly worded poll found by clicking on a clearly biased ad on some dingy polling website, blogging website, I'm sorry, that's not going to be the most accurate or representative poll that you can find. Then find out what the poll asked. And this is typically difficult to do for the average person, I understand that. It's on the poll's website usually, but that's also notoriously difficult to find. So I'm going to give you guys one resource, and I want you guys to maybe try to, one thing you take from this TED talk, look up this resource. It's called the AAPOR's Transparency Initiative. It's way up there in the top right corner. AAPOR stands for American Association of Public Opinion Research. They are trustworthy. They register polls. The polls registered there are quite likely to be trustworthy and are definitely meeting the transparency guidelines set by the Transparency Initiative. That way, you have a clear-cut path to actually accessing what the poll asks, whether it's trustworthy or not. But once you've done all this, you still don't have an overall conclusion of what the media, what the political environment is actually looking like. So always contextualize, always contextualize the results. And the first thing that you do here is you look at the margin of error. It's coincidentally hidden quite well in most media coverage. Understand that any of the values that are within this margin, or even in some cases outside of it, are possible. It's not just about what the election points on the surface, which way the, uh, poll, which way the polling points on the surface, but about what is possible. And that will make you appreciate the great deal of uncertainty that pollsters have to deal with. After looking at the margin of error, I'll contextualize it even further by looking at a few more polls. Look at polling aggregators like 538, who combine these sort of polls, average it out, and give you an overall picture instead of you maybe uh, getting carried away with an outlier polls like many media friends often do. But, you know, if you do all that, I would say you as a citizen are quite likely to understand the polling and be able to make good conclusions that actually will turn out in reality. But the biggest thing that you as a citizen can do is to actually help the polls. Because if you think about it, public opinion polls are exactly that. They rely on public opinion. You, the public, we rely on you. So if you ever get the chance to answer a poll, if somebody asks you to answer a poll, please understand that it's greatly valuable to us and also greatly helpful to our democracy. So please take the time to answer it. It's only possible by viewers like you. Now, just to close, I want to leave you guys with something that one of my advisors told me that really stuck with me when I started this research process. He said, polls are like a mirror. They show you what the public really, really believe in and what they really stand for. And I think that's a very powerful sentiment. So for those reasons, I say, Let's keep this mirror visible to everyone and as accurate as it can be. Thank you.